Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Bright Lights Online. I'm Erin Greenwald. I'm VP of Public Programs at the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities, as well as Editor-in-Chief of 64 Parishes Magazine. Um, we're so glad to have you with us today for the third in our Bright Lights Online series. Uh, just a little housekeeping. If you have questions during the presentation, please use the Q&A function, which is an icon located at the bottom of your screen. It says Q&A. You can type your question in there and we'll be able to see it and look forward to answering some of your questions at the end of the session. I also want to remind everyone that in January, we have two additional Bright Lights Online programs. We have Kushada Cultural Legacies, a conversation with lifetime contributions to the humanities awardees, Linda and Bertney Langley. They'll be in conversation with historian Denise Bates from Arizona State University on January the 8th at 11 a.m. And then on January 15th, we wrap up the series with Capturing New Orleans, photographer Charles Lovell, who is the recipient of the Michael P. Smith Memorial Award for Documentary Photography, will be in conversation with Music Inside Out's Gwen Tompkins. But today I'm very pleased to be in conversation with Elisa Plant, who is the director of LSU Press. LSU Press has published nearly 3,500 titles since 1935. Uh, and Elisa has a long history with the press and in editing in general. She serves as director of the press and publisher of the Southern Review. From 2015 to 2019, Elisa served as editor-in-chief of University of Nebraska Press, and that's where she went after she had served as an acquisitions editor for LSU Press for nearly a decade. Elisa Plant holds a PhD in history from Yale University, and I'm really excited to have her here today. Welcome, Elisa. Thanks, Erin. I'm You're delighted very welcome. to be here. So. Um, LSU Press is celebrating its 85th year uh, this year. It's a, it's a milestone anniversary. I'm wondering if you can tell us a bit about LSU Press's founding and let us know where LSU Press stands in relation to some of the other regional and national um, university presses in terms of its founding. Sure. Um, LSU Press was founded in 1935 by Marcus Wilkerson, it's, uh, the press's first director. He um, was an LSU graduate and uh, actually a faculty member in the journalism school. And so, and he in fact continued to teach even while he was director of the press. Um, and the press was not um, the first press in the South, uh, but it's close. Um, uh, UNC was founded in 1922, North Carolina Press. Um, Georgia was founded in 1938. Uh, Mississippi was founded in like 1960. So we're, we're definitely one of the earlier presses in the South. The earliest press overall um, is Johns Hopkins and that uh, founded in uh, 1878. So that's the first scholarly press in the United States. And, um, and uh, Marcus Wilkerson from the very first really set the direction of the press. He established uh, the, that it would be sort of a, a, a regional press focusing on the history, the culture, the literature of the South. And that's what he, that's what he thought was the wheelhouse. And that's really what the press has um, expanding into certain other areas, which I hope we'll get to talk about, but that's really what the press has, has done um, for the past 85 years. I think you guys are uh, incredible in terms of the breadth of your publications. I can see that you've clearly gone into other areas, but you have remained faithful mm -hmm. to focusing, much like the LEH, on Louisiana. Um, all right. aspects of Louisiana from right. natural history and history to photography. Um, LSU Press is very, very strong as a, as a regional press. Can you tell us, for the folks on this program who maybe are less familiar with how publishing works, which is probably mm -hmm. everybody, myself included, even though I'm kind of in this world. <laughs> and an LSU Press author, actually. So. Yes, and an LSU Press author. What is a university press? What, is, what does it mean to be a university press in comparison to any other kind of press? And how does that definition stand today relative to what that might have meant 50 years ago? 
Right. I mean, a lot of people don't know what a university press does, and we routinely get calls asking if we publish the yearbook or if we're associated with the newspaper or whatever it is, uh, because people think press and they think printing press. And we, you know, we do not print our own books. We send them off to printers. Um, but um, a university press, a scholarly press, basically extends the mission of its parent institution by publishing works of scholarly and um, in some cases creative excellence and, and value. Now that's, the, that's a kind of basic definition of a university press. The fact is that university presses, uh, when they first started, when LSU Press started in 1935, uh, it, is very it looked very different from, from what it does today. Um, in 1935, um, and before LSU and all, um, uh, basically all scholarly presses published works of professors, published works by faculty for other faculty and in very kind of narrow uh, fields. And, um, and so it was a conversation um, among, you know, among scholars. And that's, the, that's why, you know, a university press or a scholarly press. That began to change um, in the 70s, in the 80s, as, and I, I should also mention that university presses enjoyed um, substantial support from their parent institutions. They were almost completely underwritten. Um, they had standing orders with libraries, and libraries would buy every book they published. And, um, and so they didn't really have to worry about sales to, you know, to people you know, to individuals, they were just like, okay, well, here is what we're going to publish, and we know that the libraries are. We're going to have robust library sales, and you know, we've, and um, you know, we'll be good. Well, um, starting in the '70s and '80s, that began to change as state budgets began being cut, and states started cutting, um, you know, uh, the university budgets. So. Um, and what happened was then, you know, these standing orders from the libraries began to fall off. Um, some subsidi subsidies were, were cut. And, um, and so the press, presses everywhere, LSU among them, started to basically think, okay, so what, do, what can we do here? We've got to, we've got to figure out a way to, uh, to survive. And so um, as a result, they st we started publishing books not just for faculty to talk to each other, but to, uh, you know, to books about uh, books aimed more at the general reader, um, books aimed at, at kind of smart people who like to read. And so um, early in the day, those were, we started experimenting with coffee table books, photography mm -hmm. books, um, and those did very well. I mean, uh, C.C. Lockwood, a renowned Louisiana photographer, we published many of his books and, um, and those did really well. Um, sports books have, you know, we started publishing you know, the Fighting Tigers, for example. Um, and um, things have, our, our, um, our general interest lists have, have evolved somewhat, but, mm -hmm. uh, but we, you know, we, we certainly publish, you know, we publish books aimed at um, people who like to read. You know, we recently have, um, gone into cookbooks. We publish books about music. We publish books about Louisiana culture, um, history books um, for, and so, you know, that's, we, we really have, um, we and other university presses too, I should say, um, really are interested at engaging with, you know, the broader public. Um, right. So, yeah. You hear this, this term sometimes, um, publishing to the trade. Can you tell us what it means to be publishing trade lines versus academic scholarly lines? Well, the trade, uh, those are the general interest books. And okay. um, those basically, you know, again, are scholarly books. Um, and we do have a, a very, um, I think, distinguished list of scholarly books um, in Southern history, Southern literature, um, environmental studies. Mm -hmm. Uh, other fields, but um, but the books aimed at the trade really are um, meant to sell, um, you know, broadly and mm -hmm. reach 
um, uh, ideally not just a, a, a regional, but ideally a national audience. And, and do they help underwrite some of the press's other projects, these they trade publications? They absolutely do, because if it's basically kind of a balance, you want you want books that will will make money to allow you to do some of the perhaps more niche specialized um, important books that uh, that we we couldn't afford to do otherwise. I mean, right. the fact is, I mean, I don't I don't want to say oh the the general interest books are just their fluff because they're not. They're no, right. mean, they're very I'm um, you know marketing a book as a trade book is is still something that is um, you know it's a it's a it's just a we we think it it might appeal to a, a more broad audience. Mm -hmm. How does a book end up being published by LSU Press? What does that process look like? Oh wow, um, that is <laughs> in five minutes or less. <laughs> It's a slow process, is what it is. Um, I will I will tell you right away. It's a very slow process. Um, basically, we um, people send us proposals for books. Um, that's I, I'm going to just give a very very broad yeah. overview. Uh, people will send us proposals for books, or we um, have a team of called. A, acquisitions or acquiring editors and their job um, that's how I came up through um, right. the ring and and their job is to go out and find books um, find good work for the press whether it's trade or scholarly mm -hmm. um, we have a in fact we have a, a, a woman at the press who's dedicated to trade projects and then I mean people specialize and indeed presses specialize all right. but the very biggest presses specialize um, and so um, we're looking for good manuscripts and people are, are sending us manuscripts. And um, if a proposal comes in and it looks good, we're like, oh, this is fantastic. Let's, let's see more of this. And we ask to see the entire manuscript. And um, they'll send us the manuscript and we're like, yeah, this looks terrific. Okay, great. Um, and then what we do, and this is what sets uh, scholarly presses, university presses apart from the big trade houses in New York, you know, like Simon and Schuster, or Penguin, right. or something, um, is the if a manuscript look, looks good, we send it out for what we call peer review. So we send it to a an expert in the same field to say, hey, you know, here's this here's this manuscript. We looked at it. We think it's good. Give us your opinion. And so these readers read the manuscript um, and give us feedback on the on the manuscript to basically to vet it to make sure that it is as good as it can be um, to make sure that it's um, you know kind of if it's a work of history that it's it's fact based it's it's vetted you know and so we get these readers reports and um, sometimes they're I mean sometimes they're bad they're not, not not very often but occasionally we'll get one that we have then have to turn the manuscript away most often we get a revise and resubmit. And so the author has to work a little more and then we'll send the manuscript back to these same readers. But um, assuming we get a recommendation to publish, then what we do is, um, is take the manuscript to our press committee. And again, this differentiates us from the big trade houses. Um, we, the press committee is made up of um, faculty from L LSU faculty, uh, and basically they vet what we publish. Um, or they, do, they don't vet what we publish, I'm sorry. Um, they have to approve everything we publish. And um, of course, you know, the fact is since things have gone through such a rigorous review process, um, generally there are very few questions at the press committee level because we work very hard to ensure that our manuscripts you know, are, will stand the test of time. That right. are you know, and so, um, so that's that's how a manuscript is acquired. But then, you know, once once the manuscript it passes press committee, gets a contract, there's still like a year before publication yeah. because it has to be copy edited. Uh, we have veteran, uh, we have copy editors in house and freelancers that um, that our authors work with. It has to be designed. Um, all our design is done in-house. We have fabulous designers. It has to be marketed mm -hmm. um, and sold and you know put out there. Um, 
and so it's it it's a long process because again it's it's a very um at every step we try to do what we can to ensure excellence and um and i do want to at this point i actually think i need to shout out to all my fabulous staff and colleagues who you know do such great work and i mean um it really is like an artisanal workshop. You could not, you know, no one person could produce a book or no one department could produce a book. Everyone pulls together and we do these wonderful things and it's really cool. Yeah, I mean, I personally had a very good experience working with you guys and I'm sure that many of your authors have. You mentioned that you want to acquire manuscripts that have staying power. Can you tell us about some of the highlights? I mean, 85 years is a long time to be publishing books. I know I think of some of the books that have been most important to me in, in my career as a historian, John Blassingame's Slave Testimonies and Gwendolyn Midlow Hall's Africans and Colonial Louisiana. Those are both LSU Press books published at fairly different times. Mm -hmm. uh, what are some of the other highlights for you or for the press itself in the last 85 years? Oh, there have been a, a lot. Um, uh, the press is, well, back in, um, back in the 50s even um we published uh, c ben woodward's origins in right. the new south which was a groundbreaking work in the field of civil rights and, and still that, read today still yes graduate seminars still, all over the country exactly is still very important today and in fact laid the groundwork for our very important civil rights list um, and we have a, a deep backlist in civil rights and um publish um extensively in that field um we uh, we're the only university press that has won four Pulitzer Prizes, um, which is really uh, fantastic. Um, beginning in uh, 1981 with John Kennedy Toole's Confederacy of Dunces, um, the novel Confederacy of Dunces. Mm -hmm. And that has been translated into dozens of languages. It is worldwide um, and um, just a really iconic uh, novel of New Orleans. Um, we also have published uh, three Pulitzer Prize uh, titles in poetry, um, Henry Taylor's The Flying Change in 1986, mm -hmm. Liesl Muller's Alive Together in 1997, and Claudia Emerson's Late Wife uh, in 2005. Um, so that's, those are impressive right there. Um, we published James Lee Burke's uh, The Lost Get Back Boogie, and um, just as he was starting to uh, write his Dave Robichaux novels. Mm -hmm. And so he, I mean, uh, he, uh, James Lee Burke very generously credits the press for kind of restarting his career because he had tried uh, to get the Lost Get Back Boogie published with you know, various publishers and um, was turned away and we published it to, to great reviews. Um, we also published in 1969, The Complete Works of Kate Chopin. And that, um, I think, played a crucial role in the revival of interest in Chopin. And, yeah. um, you know, now people, she's you know, routinely assigned her novel, The Awakening, um, is, is you know, a kind of classroom staple. And, um, and her rediscovery then helped fuel the worldwide interest in women's literature in the 1970s. Mm -hmm. um, so we publish a lot of, um, very, uh, we've also published a lot of reference works about um, Louisiana and the South. Uh, we recently published a, a compendium of Louisiana musicians. Um, so we've, we've got some big kind of meaty titles. To yeah, do. yeah. I mean, I, it's, it's really to, to even try to pick four or five, it's, it's hard to do because of how many amazing titles you guys have. Um, it's interesting that the four Pulitzer Prizes are all in creative writing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I know that there are other prizes that you guys have won. Um, are, talk a little bit about the most commercially successful books. Is, is Confederacy of Dunces the most con commercially successful book in your press's history? Far and away, absolutely. Yeah. It must be. I mean, it, you must still be um, getting support from from that book. Yes. No, we, I mean, um, you know, we, the paperback uh, sells, I mean, actually, we have an agreement with Grove um, to publish, 
to for paperback rights mm -hmm. um, because it's it would just be overwhelming the the, yeah. the number of books. Um, but uh, but yeah, far and away, Confederacy of Dunces is our our biggest seller. And again, it's been translated into multiple. Uh, multiple languages uh, about five years ago, I think there was a play um, about based on Confederacy mm -hmm. in, in, uh, in Boston. Um, it's sadly movie rights have kind of never quite. I know been that's, there. Um, it's, there have been opportunities, right? It's just been. never quite. It's never quite gone been, right. It's, to plan. It, exactly. Something it's been kind of jinxed or something. But, yeah. Uh, but um, but nonetheless, it really has been a, an amazing seller. And um, again, some of our some of our backlist titles, um, you know, like in the wake of, I mean, our, in the wake of the Black Lives Matter uh, movement this past summer, Scott Ellsworth's Death in the Promised Land, um, the the book about the 1921 Tulsa race riots, mm -hmm. that suddenly that book was published in 1992. And suddenly, it's flying out the door. Or Did you have to reprint? We, 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 it's, it's set up. Yeah, I mean, we we meet demand, but um, but yes, absolutely. And um, and so that's terrific, you know. Um, yeah. Books by um, uh, John Hope Franklin. Um, you know, right. his his father was in Tulsa during the race riots and read a memoir about it, which we published. And so that also is seeing a resurgence of interest. So. Um, so we've got some, I mean, the, the great thing about what we do is that we have books that are important then and can also have a second life depending, or, you know, a continued life or a second life, depending on what, what's going on in the world. Yeah. And, um, and I think that's really important. Yeah, I think Confederacy of Dunces is, is such an interesting um, situation, right? Because I remember the first time that I read it, I was in college at Tulane and I was working at Antoine's restaurant. Oh, really? Which was in itself its own um, right. awakening um, <laughs> as one of like five female staff members mm. in the entire place. But, you know, for a while I read it every two years oh, and, wow. um, you know, just loved it. And, and New Orleans, you can see the changes in New Orleans um, reflected in how much the disconnect between that book and kind of the day-to-day -day in New Orleans is is growing, I think. And I, I wonder, it, it feels like such a very local story. Um, the characters in it are strike me as only being characters you would find here in New Orleans, but clearly it appeals to people around the world. What, what do you think it is about Confederacy of Dunces that has pulled so, so many people into its orbit yeah you know, that is a really interesting question because i i'm not i'm not from louisiana um and so when i read it in college too and um and i thought i mean it's it seems so fantastical and so you know like oh my good this is this is just kind of this can't be real. It, you know this is just like, yeah, like wow this guy's got a you know and um, and then I moved here, and I had lived here for some years, and reread it, and I had a completely different reaction to this book. I was like, "Oh my gosh, you know, this is all, yeah. oh my goodness!" And so, um, so I think perhaps some of that is in play. People read this, and and you know, it draws you in, you know, and all these characters. But it it also, I, I mean, it's. It's funny in a it's over it's funny in an over the top way that when you live here and you read it it it's it it's not it's not as funny. I mean, we've, it's funny. No, it's because uh, we've it's all a met a dark. Trixie, right? We've, yes, we've exactly. All met that person from Levy yeah. Pants. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so it's a very kind of dark, mordant humor, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. For sure. Yeah. Are there other books that are commercially successful, obviously not to the extent of Confederacy of Dunces, but that, you know, are perennial favorites? The C.C. Lockwood book strikes me as one that would probably have good staying, staying power. Yeah, C.C. Lockwood uh, books, the, um, uh, we published a book, the, the, um, oh, what was it? The, um, the Architect. I'm see now I'm totally blanking. Um, a Hayes Town. Oh, yeah. oh, A Hayes Town, right? Yeah, 
Um, and um, that every, you know, kind of every holiday season, you see an uptick uh, in that. Um, mm -hmm. And um, some of our cookbooks have been do doing, again, those are more recent, but have been yeah. doing very well. We published um, the Confederacy of Dunces cookbook, actually, um, which, again, every holiday season, you see a kind of uptick in, in yeah. that. Um, and uh, that that's a real um, strong contender. Um, but um, we've published, um, and again, some of our poetry uh, has been uh, very, very strong too. I mean, interestingly, right after the pandemic, Alive Together, um, maybe it's just the, the title, I don't know. Yeah. Lisa Muller actually died this past spring, I think not due to COVID, but just of old age. And I think, you know, then we saw an uptick in, in sales of her book as well, so. Yeah, it's gotta be difficult to try to predict what is, I mean, obviously you're not likely to predict a pandemic, but I know when you when you are acquiring books, you are kind of understanding what's happening in the field frequently. Right. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, as was the case with the, the book that became popular again after the Black Lives Matter protests, mm -hmm. um, do you have, I mean, you don't have a crystal ball, but it certainly must benefit the press to hit on titles that then become very popular in their subject matter because of contemporary events. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's true. I mean, and, um, and I, sometimes it can be, um, it actually can be alarming. I mean, it can have unintended consequences like after 9-11 for example this is this doesn't relate to LSU per se um, but there was one book on Al-Qaeda one recent book on Al-Qaeda and um, I think it was the University Press in New England that published this book it's a very small press and all of a sudden everyone wanted this book right and so it's you're faced with this like okay what how how do we get how do we meet supply right. and and how do you predict print runs accurately? And how do you get things? Because, you know, back then people were doing more print runs. I mean, now uh, we have print on demand technology, which mm -hmm. basically, you know, obviates the need for a print run unless it's a very kind of complicated design, right? Um, but, um, and also has the benefit of your book can stay in print forever, right? Um, yeah. You never have to put anything out of print because it's print on demand. And if someone wants it, they, you know, we can, we can easily meet, meet, you know, the need, but for a kind of crushing instant demand like that with the, with, you know, you've got the, the one book on Al Qaeda that everyone wants to get their hands on. That's like a oh, wait, you know, what do yeah. do here? so. Have you guys had any dark horse titles like that where you, you know, you have an established print run of X number of copies and the book comes out and the demand is immediately so great and you didn't anticipate it that you've had to immediately kind of go into a reprint? Yeah, that happen That happens frequently. I mean, that, not at the same scale, right. you know, it's something like that, but, um, but that does happen. I mean, we're um, very fortunate uh, this, in fact, this season, um, J. Ducote's Outdoor Cooking is on our fall list and yeah, you know, we printed a lot of books, but it's um, but it's doing really well, and we're back at the printer with it. And that's so great. That's, it's a great problem to have. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How many books does the press publish annually, on average? About seventy, maybe seventy wow. to seventy-five, something like that. Yeah. Has the pandemic impacted your operations? You know, I I thought that it might, and it has not. We have met all our deadlines. Our printers stayed open. Mm -hmm. um, we, everyone, again, a big shout out to the LSU Press staff because yeah. everyone's, you know, working remotely from their homes. I mean, here's my home office and, uh, and we've just been carrying on like usual. It's, it's been really, I mean, we have a variety of, I mean, thankfully our database is, um, is cloud-based and we have some project management software that's also in the cloud and, you know, we Zoom or email or do all the things. Right. And, um, and it's really, it's been, it's been terrific. I mean, um, so I miss, I will say, I mean, that said, I miss seeing my, seeing people. Yeah. You know, I mean, oh, it's, of it's course. Yeah, to we do too. Do. I'm in my house and as so, well. Yeah. I, yeah. And, and it's just like, 
wait, you know, I mean, like our, our holiday party is next week on Zoom and we'll yeah. all put on ugly holiday sweaters and, and have <laughs> fun, but it's not, it's not the same, you know? Yeah, for sure. Well, I'm really, it's great to hear that you guys haven't been negatively impacted by um, the pandemic in terms of your, your editorial and publishing process. Um, are there certain authors or uh, contributors, that, projects that are kind of legendary in LSU press lore? I mean, I'm sure, I, I'm thinking about John Kennedy Tool's mother and the right. Walker Percy situation, but th are there others that kind of get passed down from one director and from editor to editor about, oh, you can't believe the time and this and this, and obviously you can't yeah. talk about things too recent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, there is, I, for people who don't know, I mean, the um, John Kennedy Toole, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, committed, died by suicide and, um, and left Confederacy. And his mother, Thelma Toole, basically badgered everyone, you know, with Confederacy of Dunces. You've got to read this, you've got to publish this. And, um, and finally badgered Walker Percy, the novelist Walker Percy, into reading it. And he was like, okay, fine and started reading it and was like, oh, wow, this is, this is really good. And so he took it to uh, then press director Les Philibaum, who published it as part of their, the then fiction program. Um, and, and, you know, then, you know, the rest is history there. Um, but, um, but yes, actually, one, one funny story is, uh, William Luchtenberg, and in fact, I, I was at the press for the kind of end part of this. Um, William Luchtenberg, a very distinguished historian, uh, American historian, at, uh, now retired at the University of Chapel Hill, um, he gave the, the Fleming lectures in Southern history at LSU back in, I think it was 1991, and um, before I was at the press, and long before I was at the press. And, um, uh, and the press from a very, from very early in the history um, published the Fleming lectures, you know, as a, um, and so it was in fact one of our first series, like from the 1930s. Um, and normally, you know, after, you, you know, you kind of give these lectures, revise them, send the manuscript in and we publish it within a year or two. And these books are generally, you know, a couple hundred pages at most, okay? And, um, Sometimes, you know, something happens and, and the manuscript never comes in and it's like, okay, fine. But, uh, but most of the time they do. And um, so he, you know, Luchtenberg gave these lectures and then went away and nothing, apparently nothing happened and I, you know, and time went on. And um, then in 2006, a large box arrived at the press from North Carolina. And, uh, <laughs> It was inside was, uh, this is, I was working for the press then, inside was a 900 page manuscript, okay? A 900 page manuscript and a brief note addressed to an editor who no longer worked there saying, here it is, you know, here's the manuscript, look forward to working with you or something like this. And um, <laughs> we were obviously delighted to have this manuscript from such a renowned historian, but we were, I mean, everyone was completely clueless. My uh, uh, my colleague, Rand Dodson, who is um, now editor-in-chief and, um, you know, acquires in Southern history, uh, this landed in his lap and he's like, well, wait, what's going on? So before <laughs> contacting him, we did kind of a deep dive and put the pieces together and figured out, oh, this is the Fleming lectures, except it was, you know, suddenly turned into this very uh, substantial book. Um, what was the topic so of the book? It was, well, we published it to much acclaim. It's The White House Looks South, Franklin Roosevelt, uh, Harry Truman, and Lyndon B. Johnson. And it was about, you know, how the White House engaged, how these three presidents engaged with the South. And it won an award. I mean, it was, <laughs> you know, but, but when it came in, we were like, okay, what's what going it? on? Here? You know, yeah. So that was, that's one that I, I can remember a little bit you know, because Rand was just baffled. And, um, so that was that was kind of funny yeah yeah i, I mean I, it, it is important to to recognize that lsu press is i think top in its field in publishing louisiana history 
uh, history, culture, anthropology, literary theory, natural history, but you maintain a very, very broad circle of titles outside of uh, even Southern history. Can you tell us about some of the strong um, lines that you guys have that are outside of, of what many people might associate with LSU Press? Well, I think one of the uh, real jewels in our list is our poetry list. Um, and um, LSU wasn't the first, but uh, again, we were one of the first presses to publish poetry. Our first title was um, appeared in 1964. Uh, it was by uh, a title by Miller Williams, Lucinda Williams' dad. And ah. um, yeah, and um, and uh, from that day on, um, from 1964 to now, um, the press has published poetry, and uh, the two previous directors, Les Philibaum, um, Les really ramped up the, uh, the poetry program, and my predecessor, Mary Catherine Calloway, was equally committed to it, as am I. I mean, it's a mm -hmm. really, uh, it's a really distinguished list. Um, we publish seven books a season. Uh, wow. We have hundreds of queries every year, um, and in fact, we are, it's basically, um, we're, kind of two where we were booked two years in in advance um, on you know kind of I think um, looking at the 2023 spring list for you know that's the first open slot and mm -hmm. um, and I think it definitely contributes to our our national prominence you know again yeah. we um, you know three Pulitzers and and within uh, recent years we've also had two um, finalist for the National Book Award in poetry. So it's it's a very renowned, renowned list. So and people wouldn't necessarily think to yeah you know to look to us for that. Right. But um yeah. So what's next? What's next for the press? You you've got 85 years behind you. Yep. Uh, what, uh, what are you most excited about right now and, and where do you think the press is going? Well um I am very, I'm really excited about uh, where the press is right now. Uh, we are publishing terrific books. We have a great fall lineup. Our spring catalog uh, is just now out. Um, in fact, I encourage, I'm just gonna take this opportunity to, to, uh, to plug our books and say everyone should check out our website. It's lsupress.org. Um, go to our website and um, you know check out our catalog for our books. Um, obviously we, I want us to keep building on our strengths, you know, what history, poetry, uh, literary studies, um, uh, but we are starting to, among other things we're doing, we're starting to publish books that um, engage with issues, issues of social justice. We're starting mm -hmm. to live in that. Uh, we're exploring ways to get content to, I mean, content, it's a, 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 a I know. kind of term of, <laughs> you know, whatever, but, uh, uh, but you know, like 20 years ago, eBooks were the the thing, and right. everyone was like, "Oh my gosh, you know, eBooks," and and the print book is going to die, and everything's going to be, you know, you know, eBooks. And now, I mean, eBooks are still there and have flattened out about nine to ten percent of our sales. That's people do read eBooks. Um, now, audiobook sales are rising, so we're you know, kind of exploring. Um, ways to get audio, um, more mm -hmm. of our books and audio. I also really want to, um, uh, uh, one of my goals for the press is to kind of really focus on kind of exporting, if you will, Louisiana culture to a broader national, even international audience. I mean, uh, we, for example, we have the new, uh, we have a new series on iconic New Orleans cocktails that, uh, and we're, uh, and other, you know, kind of more serious, if you will, uh, topics as well, but people are fascinated by the, by, you know, by the culture of Louisiana. Thank goodness for us. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's food. When I was living up in Nebraska, you know, and I was traveling around and sometimes I'd wear an LSU ball cap and people would come up to me and say, are you from there? And want to talk about it and want to ask me questions, yeah. about whatever it is about Mardi Gras or food or, you know, and, um, and it just made me think there's this huge there's this huge kind of audience for, you know, for Louisiana, you know, across the, across the nation. And I'd like to, I'd like to kind of uh, 
capitalize on that, if you will. I think that's, um, you know, we, we share that in common uh, at the LEH and at 64 Parishes Magazine in particular. We're all about um, amplifying the, the good, the bad, and the ugly, yep. but always the interesting parts mm -hmm. about yep. living here and being in a place that contains multitudes and contains, you know, so many different cultures, mm -hmm. some of them well mixed and some of them not. Right. Um, exactly. People really like to hear about Louisiana. We are, we are endlessly um, fascinating, I think. Um, <laughs> yes. LB, uh, LB has a question for you. Uh, she wants to know if you have recommendations for books for the holidays for friends and family from LSU Press. We have many, many books, um, some of which I, I actually can show, can show some books. Good idea. We have Jay Ducote's Outdoor Cooking, which I mentioned before, we are reprinting. Um, and here's the, the little, it's a, this new, I, I love these book, little small format books. Little, um, they and feel the, good in your hand. It feels, it feels good in your hands and it's actually got color images in it as well. It's a, it came out beautifully. Um, so you've got, you know, kind of things like that. Uh, we also published um, this really cool New Orleans architecture um, book. Is that on, part of a on, series? It was, it, well, it was part, it, they were with Pelican Publishing for some years. And um, then when Pelican uh, got bought by Arcadia, they came to us. And so we are now publishing them. And the next two volumes are going to be the French Quarter. So that will be really great. You know, we are yeah. hopeful, fingers crossed for Those that. Those are really important reference books. We used to use them all the time when I was at h &OC. Yeah, no, exactly. They really are. And um, we also have um, Ed Ayers, a very well-known uh, award-winning uh, American historian. Um, this is a super cool book. It's the Migrations of the American South um, from 1790 to 2020. Um, basically, this story told in maps. And oh, it goes all great. the way up. It has maps about about COVID nineteen in here. Um, and in fact, curiously, wow. this, this book was um, based on Fleming lectures. So, um, but uh, they're really it's a really interesting. Is this the uh, same Ed Ayers as Promise of the New South? Yeah, it's not. Yeah, I think, I think so. I mean, he's no. uh, he's won he's won yeah. raft awards. Yeah. I mean, um, so yeah. Yeah. That's that's fantastic. Congrats to you guys. Um, well, and we but, also have, um, just for, for poems, Henry Taylor. Um, this Henry Taylor is one of our Pulitzer, and, and uh, this is just his latest collection, um, New and Selected. Oh, and we also have a book on propaganda, a very big book, John Maxwell Hamilton, Manipulating the Masses. So Seems we, timely. We, yeah, exactly. So something for everyone. Yeah. That's great. I mean, I, I do think um, if you guys visit, if the audience visits lsupress.org, you're, you're sure to find um, something for everybody on your list. Um, and if you don't, you can always get a subscription to 64 Parish. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah, so we, we do have some questions from um, our audience. Uh, let's see, we've got... questions about format, um, whether you feel that the, the print book is, is making a comeback. I mean, I think you talked about that a little bit with the um, predictions about the demise of print relative to eBooks. Um, I'm wondering if you're seeing uh, increased readership of print books industry-wide uh, during the pandemic. Yes, I mean, I think the answer is absolutely, our, our sales, when, when this first started back in March and we all, you know, kind of set up our home offices and, and um, you know, the, all the directors, I mean, um, of various presses are kind of talking to each other about like, how's it going and so on. And among other things, everyone was like, what are, what are we doing with sales projections? Because, you know, obviously this is, to use an overused word, unprecedented. And so, yeah. Um, and no one knew what was going to happen. So what we, um, so we kind of cut our sales projections back, and we're kind of nervous. And um, initially, um, sales did kind of crater at the very beginning of the pandemic because Amazon rightly was prioritizing PPE yeah. and things like this. But then, starting in May, um, sales picked back up, 
and they have been strong ever since. I mean, I, I it's it's fantastic. I think I think people are perhaps reading more in the pandemic as uh, again the Black Lives Matter movement um, helped drive some of our backlist titles. Um, we have a very strong uh, you know, slate of uh, books this fall, um, but but sales have been very good. So, and yeah, I, I hear anecdotally that from other directors as well. So, so I think that's, I think people may, just, may be reading more. I think they're reading more and I think they're, they're reading to try to understand our complicated current context. Right. Um, it's not just the pandemic, it's, it's mm -hmm. you know, racial injustice, it's environmental issues. People are right. home and they are looking for answers. Um, and a university press publication is always a good place to start. Um, we've seen a tremendous uptick in readership online um, at oh, really? 64parishes.org. Oh yeah, it's, it's been That's through fantastic. the roof. Um, mm -hmm. And talking with editors at other humanities councils and at Humanities Magazine in DC, they've seen a similar surge. Mm -hmm. um, but I certainly have wanted to have a printed book in my hand, I think, probably because we're all spending so much time on screens right now yes. um, that, yeah. that it's, it's good to hold a book. But I've also started listening to a lot more audiobooks than I ever had before. Audio. Um, it's easier, you know, it, you're, it's right. kind of a passive right. Right. experience. You can, you can be doing household chores or whatever while you're listening to an audiobook. Mm -hmm. um, is that a, an area where you see the press expanding um, in terms of producing audiobooks and how do you end up pairing an a text with a reader for example because i know that i have audiobooks that i love in in large part because of who's reading them and then right. ones that i i really don't like that i like in print because of who's reading right. them right 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 i do not i don't i i'm not entirely sure i need to answer your question i i'm not a big audiobooks person yet. I mean, I may actually come to this, but uh, um, we have uh, agents in New York, um, Macintosh and Otis, who are, handle all our sub rights, uh, subsidiary rights. And by that, I mean, film or audio or, you know, TV, made for TV movies or translations, basically anything that is not an actual book um, that is kind of transformative is a subsidiary right. And that includes audio. And so, um, Macintosh, we are very fortunate, in fact, to have Macintosh and Otis, Otis represent us. Um, we're the only scholarly press they do represent. Wow. And so, yeah, it's, it's really cool. Um, um, and they handle our audio agreements and we, you know, kind of give them, uh, um, you know, we kind of say here, here are some books we think would work well for audio and they go out and, and pitch them and then come back to, uh, you know, obviously, you know, we, we have to, we, we ultimately make the agreement. It's not like they're saying, oh yeah, we'll just sign up this LSU press book. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, but in terms of the logistics of how you match things, it, you know, that's something that is, that's a different kind of. Yeah. Well, we'll see where that goes in the, yeah. in the coming yeah. years. I, I, think. I, do, I do think it's a real, I think it's a uh, hot field. I think it's really growing. Yeah. Agreed. So, well, I hope that you guys are around for another 85 years. Um, it's been a privilege to talk with you today. Um, we appreciate you spending your time and we thank you for all that LSU Press does to promote Louisiana and to help people all over the world understand this place that we're in, this crazy place, Louisiana. Yeah. Um, you, you guys really our champions of culture, which is why the well, LEH gave you the award. And, and thank you so much, you know, for um, for the award. I mean, which is just tremendously, uh, we were just thrilled and honored um, to get this. And um, and thanks to you for all you, you and LEH uh, do and all the good work you do to spread the, I mean, we're and doing the same thing and in, in spreading the kind of culture of, of Louisiana and, um, and I've, I've really enjoyed this conversation. It's been a lot of fun. Me too. So. It's been great. Thanks, Elisa. Talk to you Thank soon. Thank you, Erin. Okay, take care. Bye. Bye.